When you're fed up with fighting food and your body, join us here. I'm Ali Shapiro, creator of the Truce with Food program and your host for Insatiable, where we explore the hidden aspects of fighting our food, our weight, and our bodies, and dive deep into nutrition science and true whole health. Fair warning, this is not your parents' health care. This is a big rebel yell to those who crave meaning, hunger for truth, and whose lust for life is truly insatiable. Believe me, freedom awaits. Welcome, everybody, to season five of Insatiable. This season, our theme is eating triggers, namely triggers for the on-off eating cycle. And what we're going to be talking about is how to get clear on these triggers. And why do we care about clarity so much? Because clarity is a process and a tool. Why, you might be asking, for three main reasons. First of all, you get to the root cause of things, right? Part of why we have all these offshoots of of our relationship to food, intuitive eating, and uh, pleasurable weight loss, and all this other stuff, which is they can all be helpful in their own rights, but we're still focusing on the food and giving all the power to the food instead of looking to what's actually causing us to eat. So we haven't really gotten to the root cause, in my opinion, of why we turn to food. So we're going to get you closer to your own root causes in this season. The second reason is logic just doesn't change us. How many times have you known that you needed to make a change, but hearing all the facts and figures and reasons why, how often has that really changed us? Actually connecting our own experiencing and getting clarity helps us. And just kind of a concrete example of that is I used to think I hated dogs, right? (laughs) I was like, I'm not a pet person. And I had some really good reasons why I'm allergic to them. They just seem like a lot of work. And then my husband, Carlos wanted to get a dog and I had to have personal experience and get clear that actually First of all, I had to get a hypoallergenic dog. But a big reason that I thought I didn't like dogs is I was afraid of them. And I was afraid of them because I didn't know how to be around them. And now that I know how to be around them, guess what? I like love my dog. So that's just an example of how clarity helps. (laughs) And then lastly, clarity equals distance. So we've all probably had experiences that we can look back in the past now and just don't trigger us the same way. We can say, oh, this is why this happened. This is why this person was this way. I could have done this better. And the reason that we are able to do that is because we have some distance from the situation. And when we can get distance in the moment, even a little bit, we can start to get more agency or independent choice around things and not reach for food. And so that's why clarity is so important. Okay, so today we're talking about social media. With its impossible standards for everything from beauty to cooking, it triggers us to compare, feel jealousy, doubt ourselves, and all the above at once. In today's episode, Eating Triggers, How to Have a Healthy Relationship with Social Media, Juliet and I will clarify the three reasons social media triggers us to eat and ideas on how to have a healthy relationship with social media. For our new listeners, Juliet is active in the fitness community since 2008. It's in a decade. She's an expert in her field with a very loyal feeling, loyal following from Philadelphia after working in New York City as a personal trainer at prestigious sports clubs. She is the partner and nutrition director for Unite Fitness Studio Franchises, a rapidly growing group in personal training studio, helping to craft Unite's trademark heart, muscle, mind, workout methodology. Juliet appears as a regular contributor on Fox and ABC News, She helps educate people on the topics of fitness, health, and nutrition. And when she's not in the studio, Juliet loves to connect with nature and frequently takes trips to Woodstock, New York area to hike and relax. All right. Welcome back, Juliet. Hello. That was a mouthful. (laughs) I know. (laughs) Did you hear me go? It's okay. You did a great job. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) I love that you uh, didn't think that you were a dog person. Yeah, right. And I was. I had a similar experience with that growing up. I was always afraid of dogs. And that's why I just, you know, said, oh, I'm a cat person. 
because they just didn't scare me as much as dogs. I didn't know you were afraid. Yeah. I, I Yeah. And my mom, she like got bit by a dog when she was younger. And so we didn't have dogs growing up. And, you know, her saying like, oh, they're dangerous or, you know, she got bit by one. Of course, when you're young and you hear that, and then it makes made me afraid of dogs. I only, I only ever wanted to be near like the little dogs, but the little ones actually sometimes are more scary than the big ones. <laughs> right. That's what I've learned. And that's what I think is hysterical because people think that they just like relate this certain way to food, right? And then you get more clear. But yeah, I realized I've never had a bad experience with a dog, but I was always afraid of them. And I realized I was just afraid of them because I didn't know how to have the skill set around them. And I Yeah, it's just the unknown, right? So then we just cut ourselves off by just being like, nope, not going there. Yes, yes. And that's why I'm so excited that we are going to talk about that what triggers us with social media today, because I'm going to give everybody a tool that we're going to kind of go through to talk about why social media triggers us so much. But one of the main emotions is the unknown, and we'll get more into that. But one of the things before we get into this tool that I'm going to share, and that it's the first tool that we use and why am I eating this now, is both of us, you know, we talked about this episode. It's important for people to realize that of all the triggers we're going to be talking about this season, all of them are inherently neutral. And it's more about what it triggers in us, right, Juliet? Like we can say we hate social media, but it's what does it bring up in us that is the yeah. reason that it's so triggering? Yeah, because there are lots of positives to things. It's just what sensation and what emotion do you bring to the table when you're saying that, oh, I hate social media. It's so bad for people. It's this, it's that. But what is it triggering in you that's making you feel that way? Because inherently, it's just, it's just a platform, right? Just like mm-hmm. anything else. And there's a lot of positives and, and there are, are negatives, but they're different for each person. So yeah, I think we want to talk about, you know, what is it for you, Allie? What is it for me? And a lot of our listeners, I'm sure, can relate. Oh, yeah. In fact, I asked a bunch of my clients who, who have given me permission um, to share their questions and experiences just to kind of get me back into that place of what people are really struggling with. So. I'm going to give you this tool. And again, it's a clarity tool. And we talk a lot about this podcast about being self-critical versus self-aware. And what we're often doing when we're checking in with ourselves, we think we're checking in with ourselves, but we're actually trying to manage how other people are reacting to us. And so I really want you to practice with this tool, bringing a beginner's mind. Like, do I really know myself? And the tool is what is at the tail end of this? And tail stands for tired. And what's really interesting and kind of what people have lack of clarity around is how depleted they are at the end of the day when they're turning, in this case, to social media. But really, this it's a purely energy piece. The A stands for anxious. I hear all people, like I think everyone tells me, I've heard people say they have anxious, they're anxious, they have anxiety. And what's usually under that is uncertainty, the unknown that Juliet and I were talking about with dogs. (laughs) We'll talk about how the uncertainty gets triggered with social media today. You know, a lot of it is like, what am I missing? Like, am I behind? How does everyone else have their life so together, right? It's like this anxiousness, but really what's under it is uncertainty. The I stands for inadequate. So ugh, this is often when people will feel like, well, I'm not enough or, oh my God, it's going to take me so much to do this and I just can't do that. So inadequacy, how am I feeling less than, being triggered to feel less than? And then the last is lonely. So why does this make me feel lonely, that I'm different, that I'm isolating myself? And I think it's really important to realize that with isolation, you can be around other people. And in fact, I think that's often the most insidious. Often my clients will say, oh, I have to be on. And when you feel like you have to be on, chances are you're going to feel lonely in that because you're not connecting on an intimate level. So now Juliet and I are going to kind of go through our own experiences with, with tail related to social media. And then we're going to kind of answer some questions and from clients that I got and also just show you how to have some healthier habits. So Juliet, what's your experience, first of all, with social media in general? Because one thing I noticed as we were going into this, I looked at both of our feeds because Mm -hmm. I think kind of just a psych 101 lesson for everybody is that 
all of us, myself included, Juliet included, we post what affirms the identities that we like about ourselves. So everybody is putting their best foot forward. And when I looked at, I, I, I have a question for you, Juliet, because I noticed that you post a lot of pictures of your body. And I noticed that I'm really comfortable with my intellect. And so I post a lot of things that are intellectual. <laughs> yeah. And I would say that you said we post, say this again. So we post the identity that we feel like most certain about is what you're saying or that we feel confident about and that we want to affirm when we want to affirm. Okay. So, so for example, well, cause I was going to, I'm sorry. Uh, cause I was going to say, I think that most people, myself included, and are posting the identity of what we think others like about us. Well, and that's often the identity that we like about ourselves. Okay. Mm-hmm. So for a, a really concrete example, I've noticed this, especially as I've started to think about being more strategic with a social media strategy for my company, is that like everyone will share when they're drinking a green smoothie or when they've just made a healthy choice, right? <laughs> but no one is showing you when they're binging alone at night. Like no one's taking a picture of all that food. So that's a very, like we want people to think we're healthy. We want to think we're healthy. Right? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so that's just, I want people to think I'm smart. Right. And that's something I've been very confident about in my life. Um, for sure. For sure. So it's not that I won't take pictures of me. It's just not what I lead with. Mm-hmm. Do you think that there's a level of insecurity that comes with the reason why you might not post certain things versus others, or just simply is just not meaningful to you? Yeah, I think if anything, I, I laugh about like the lighting game on social media. Like I feel like I'm not good at the lighting game. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> but and I, as you're listening, guys, the the fact that she even said game, like this is it's this is not real life, right? This is a snapshot of t- of of time. It's just, just little snapshots of of time, and often very curated. Well, and I'm so glad you brought that up because one of the biggest questions that I got was, what are some of the ways to separate yourself and not internalize what you're seeing in social media since some of us have a tendency to make what we see about us? And I think this is the important piece is we all know it's a game logically, right? We know this is like someone's highlight reel, one of my clients even said, but how, why do we keep scrolling? And it's because again, it's what it triggers in us, right? So it's like, for example, we'll go right to, well, I kind of wanted to go in order so it'll be easier. But sure. Like, and I just want to say this and we can come back to this, but I think that it's because most people are very unfulfilled. Yes. Or they, what one of my clients was saying, Christy, and she gave me permission to use her name. is like, mm-hmm. she often is like feeling uncertain in her career, right? She's in a big transition point. And it, she's like, I just wish it would be easier to figure it out. And when I look to other people, it's like, it almost seems like they have the answers, right? And that's part of that uncertainty and of the, of the, of the tail trigger, the anxiousness of like, what, what should I be doing? What is fulfilling, right? And yeah. so it's not, it's not that we don't know that other people are only using their highlight reel, but it triggers this doubt in ourselves. And, and I know you know, I'll, when we get to the A, I'll share my own experience with that. But it's, we can't separate that it's just a game because we make it mean something about us rather than what the people are posting. Yeah. And it, I just was um, listening to somebody say like, you know, you're the average of who you hang out with, or if you want to get rich, then hang out with rich people. Right. And it's like, if you're looking, if you're feeling uncertain in your job and you're looking into social media to kind of, you know, see what everybody else is doing, I think that that's not the same as actually being with people (laughs) and not, you know, just trying to look at their photos and sort of you're making up your own story about somebody. It's not actually what's going on. You're, you're creating all the meaning and making all the stories. Yes. I love that you said that because that's what the, the crux of my work is, is that especially the, the less data you have, the more, the, the bigger the story, right? So it's like, you're only seeing one of them. And I would just say, okay, because I am like so cynical about most social media memes. If you want to be rich, be born white, be born a white dude. Okay. <laughs> right. I know. So, so you want to go to, 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 to being depleted? Yeah. So let, cause I realize that this is a big reason that I turn to social media. And I want to just kind of put a plug in (laughs) for one of the things that I'm really working on on a physical level is what I have learned. I think we all have learned about lighting and the, like the, the blue light from the computer. But did you know that that robs you of dopamine 
And then it makes you literally feel down and depressed on a physical level. And then you need more and more of the blue light to kind of replenish. It's kind of like sugar. Like sugar depletes you nutritionally, but then you like crave more and more and you need more and more to be sensitive to it. And I think that's a really overlooked physical reason that we are addicted to social media. Yeah, the endless scroll. Yes, but the blue light and the more that you're on it, then the more that you kind of are getting you know, the dopamine from intermittent rewards, right? Because that's the other piece to this. Social media works. It's kind of like you never know when you're going to get an email. You never know when you're going to get a like. And yeah. So- and full disclosure, everybody, I'm highly addicted to social media. Yeah. So I-, I scroll in bed before I scroll. When I wake up, I go immediately to Instagram and it's unconscious. And my husband started to do it recently. And then that's when I started to get scared <laughs> because if he's doing it, like he was like my, you know, like, oh, I need to look to him to be, <laughs> to get out of this cycle. And I would I notice now that when his alarm goes off in the morning, he instantly goes to Instagram and the same with me. And there's no reason to do it. It's just some, it's, it's complete unconscious learned behavior. Right. But then on like, and we'll go through the different physical, emotional, and soul levels of why we're getting it. I think it is unconscious, but I also think a lot of people wake up tired, right? And it's like, oh, let me see what happened overnight. It's like those, that intermittent reward. Like It's almost like your cup of coffee before your coffee. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> but- yeah. It becomes, it becomes like, you know, people used to read the paper, right? Now people are just looking at their social media. I mean, there's always been that of sort of distracting yourself from the day's tasks or what you have to do because you're exhausted or you don't want to actually become present with, okay, what do I have to accomplish? Because it just sounds, maybe it does seem overwhelming or exhausting. So it's easier to sort of just distract yourself. Yes, yes, yes. Well, and what I found, what after I've been learning so much about the importance of light and sunlight and all this stuff, I've been trying to, I, I realized a big reason I was turning to social media was I was genuinely like tired and I wanted like to get feel up again, right? We're like addicted to feeling up. And this is something I have to work on. I'm, I have started to like go outside. Like that's kind of like a really concrete tip that someone can take is like go outside and get some sunlight and maybe you can tell yourself like, I'll go back to social media afterwards. But if you're really tired, getting out in the sun or walking around is actually going to be the root cause and solve, solve the issue. But I think that's, that's my experience with being tired and social media. And of course, I feel more depleted as I'm doing the endless scroll. <laughs> so I have to say something for me with like being depleted at the end of the day, especially because I'm so physically active all day, is I always have this feeling like there's more to do when I get home, right? Dishes, laundry, just, you know, paying attention to the cat. Cats, there's two of them. Um, <laughs> I feel bad. I always love my one cat more than the other, guys. It's so sad. But she's my first baby. So... And then work, of course, because I run a business and there's, there's, when you run a business or I think for most of us with work now, there's always homework, right? It's not just for, I mean, God bless you. If you can like go to the office and like leave everything behind and then you come home and the home is a safe haven and you don't have to think about work until you go back the next day. But for me, I have just constant a constant stream going on of the to-do of what I need to get done. And I've come to realize that I'm not going to get a lot done, but it's still like on my mind. And so the, the scrolling through Instagram start is that thing that I just sit there on the couch and do. And it's very depressing because, and I know in the moment I'm conscious of this isn't making me feel good. I'm, you know, you're starting to compare yourself or, you know, you're getting that feeling like that, you know, feeling of missing out on something. Someone's having fun. Someone's at a concert. Oh, you're, you know, on a Wednesday night, whatever it may be. You know, I think if before this existed, I would have never seen that. I would have never been able to be in that person's world for a moment. And so at the end of the day, I think I tend to feel guilty for not being able to do it all. And that's part of my depletion and like distraction is like, I wish that I had more time in the day to get things done. And instead I just sit there and look at Instagram for like an hour of my life. Yeah. Well, a new study just came out recently that said three people are three times more likely to feel depressed after checking social media. So you're not a lot alone on that. Yeah. And it says, you know, I'm aware of it and awareness doesn't mean change. You know, we talked about that, like you can have the knowledge, right? 
Right. It doesn't actually shift anything to know isn't to change. Right. Well, well, totally. But I think what, what's happening, and especially when, you know, I look at, and why am I eating this now? We look at the trigger, the stress response, then the behaviors, and then how to change that. But what's happening is you're kind of, you're depleted. It's the first trigger is being tired. And then you're feeling doubt, right? Why can't I get this all done? Which is the anxious part of this. And then it's probably the competitor in you that has set unrealistic deadlines, <laughs> right? And like, is like, I want to get ahead, right? And so that is part of that awareness piece of like, why am I feeling behind? Why am I feeling like I can't get it all done? Why is there so much on my plate? And looking at those fears, I think, is really, really important. Yeah, for sure. And we'll get but- to how I, how like we've kind of, or I'll, you know, I'll, well, I can share how I've kind of gotten out of some of these cycles. But yeah, and I, and I want, I think you bring up a great point too about, and I, I just want to say here, like all of our emotions are valid, right? The doubt is valid. The depletion is valid. The loneliness is valid. Where we can have some agency or independent choice is how we choose to respond and our re- behaviors. I feel like our behaviors are our responsibility, but it doesn't happen overnight. You still need to have compassion. But I think oftentimes people think feelings are bad when really they can bring a lot of awareness, especially the more you stay with them, you start to get the insights that you need. So just wanted to put that out there. Okay. So let's go to anxious because I think that's a big one for both of us because we've both had considerable trauma in our lives. (laughs) And what's your experience been with, with this trigger in terms of, I mean, you just shared like, I, am I missing out, right? FOMO um, or whatnot. Yeah. Well, the anxiety is that competitive side. I think you hit the nail on the head with that. It's like staying ahead, staying on, staying on my game. You know, (laughs) it's this weird, not weird, but it's, it's like this aggressive side of me that I know is one of my strengths in life. And it's, what's gotten me very far in life. And I'm always about, you know, getting things done. And like, I, you know, if I want something, I'm going to get it, you know? And, you know, for example, I just told Ali, I booked a trip to Greece and, you know, it's always been like this for me. And I'm like, I tell my husband, like, I booked the trip, I booked the hotel, I did this. It's like, I'm like, like, I got it done, you know? And it's like, I'm amazing. I feel, even though there's a lot of anxiety that comes along with all of that. So it's that like needing to do things and get ahead. And when I look at other people, I'm like, am I, am I staying on the path? You know, where, what are they doing? Am I doing the right thing? Cutting edge of you know, the boutique studio world. I follow so many different businesses and I'm like, what's their social media look like? What are they, you know, what are their Instagram stories look like? What do their emails look like? And it's so much of that. It's, that's a lot of anxiety. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I love that you brought that up because that's where the nuance comes into this is that it is so much of your strength, right? And it's so much of my strength too, of like, I'm actually not someone who I think needs a whole lot of rest. When I was, when I was like in the thick of building my business in graduate school, I used to go on social media and be like, do you remember that? I don't know if they're still doing this because this just is not, I've cut this, cut out following people. Mm -hmm. The people who are like, they're, they're usually business coaches and they're like, oh, I'm in Greece again, or I'm in Japan again, or I'm in, I'm just relaxing, getting a pedicure. And I was like, how are they doing that? Oh, well, that, I see that all the time. That's one of the things that's a complete anomaly to me. Like, I don't understand it at all. Yeah. How do they have like a coaching practice or, you know, and run retreats or have, you know, and I guess they can work from anywhere. Like the story that you create is, okay, I guess they're lap, there's, they, you know, they're in Fiji and they have a laptop. You know, have you ever tried to be on a laptop in the sun? It doesn't even work. <laughs> No, because I just moved to a, I just moved to a place with a pool and and like the screen would explode. Like it's so hot. You can't, you know what I mean? You you can't really enjoy yourself if you're like working on your computer and sunning. Maybe I'm, it's just not for me, but it seems very unrealistic. Yeah. But what, but what I, what, cause I didn't know this whole chain that it was activating in me. What I realized is it was, it was activating doubt. What am I doing wrong? Like I'm and I was so tired, and it it really prevented me from realizing that like first of all I'm not someone who wants to travel all the time. You can be adventurous by by staying put and reading and and learning about yourself in the world. Like that's not the only way to be adventurous, right? And I'm someone who's actually really needs in person connection and having a community. But again, this was it was what it was bringing up in me. 
not so much what those people were doing. So just a little bit about my own evolution with this and how I basically solved it for myself on some level. So when social media first came out, it used to trigger me when people would post about like, oh, this causes cancer or this does not. And I would feel, I I didn't know enough about cancer and my body and health at the time to not feel so triggered by that. I was like, should I stop doing that? Should I like, and it was like genuine full body fear. I don't know. Have you ever had that with like, maybe I have that. No, but I was just thinking even today because, you know, on BBC news, there's an article like front page that said low carb diets could shorten your life and how we really need to be going more plant-based. And it's just, again, these same, like to be front page news in BBC and there's all these, there's, you know, several studies published in here, like the you know, Lancet public health study. But I remember, you know, we had this with eggs. We had this with, you know, we've had this with so many different things over the years that at this point, I'm just like, I have to eat for me, not for what BBC tells me. <laughs> yeah. Exactly, exactly. But but that's trusting yourself. But there is that little inner part of us that are like, hmm. Yeah, I think the important thing is to learn to detach from it. Like you can still, because you still want to be open to information, right? You don't want to just like, like the same way that you need to still check in on those boutique studios. It's just how you dose it, right? It's like, and that was, that's kind of the next ring around the staircase that I realized with social media. And I shared about it a little bit, but it really like comparing myself from a business perspective to other people was just like, and it was always women, right? And it was kind of this pattern of feeling like I didn't belong. And I think a lot of the emotional hunger that we have when we come on social media is, is am I going to be visible? Am I going to be invisible? And so what am I doing to make sure that that's not happening instead of figuring out what's important for us to be recognized by and like yeah. our values. And when I was like, you know, now I've started to realize, so what I did for people who are helping, cause someone was like, how do you just not care? And I think the important thing is to realize that actually the healthier you get, the more you're going to care, <laughs> the more you care about the world. And, and that was part of my problem is like a lot of the people that I would compare myself to on social media is I wasn't even doing the same things as them. Like they were, they had a very different, like, was more about shopping and pleasure and all this kind of stuff. But I made myself wrong for having the values that I had and what actually helped me stop comparing myself wasn't that I stopped caring. It was that I found people both professionally, first of all, it had to be professional, that shared the same values as me. So I started connecting to other, because I had really isolated myself in the wellness industry because as Juliet said, it's a game and that unfortunately wellness has been turned into this capitalistic enterprise. And I don't really like a lot of the wellness industry. I shouldn't say I don't like, it's just not the right. I think you can say that. I think you can be very candid about that because I agree. I, I don't like it. I don't agree with it. It's a lot of it feels really disingenuous and almost, almost like immoral, like just yeah. preying on people's um, insecurities and, you know, and making it more complicated. That was my yeah, crazy was insecure, making it complex, and also it's all for profit. Well, it's not all for profit, but a lot of it's for profit. Yeah, it totally is. And I was like, "What am I missing?" Right, the doubt. And then I, my competitor mode was like, "I'm so behind. I don't understand how these people have this all figured out." And what happened was, as I started to connect with colleagues in like in, in oh, online, actually most of it, and finding people who had the same sense of rootedness and and kind of evidence based approach to things. I'm talking about like Dr. Kelly Rogan, like you, my friend Amy Valpone from the Healthy Apple, and like Jolene Hart, who's also in Philly, and like really connecting with people who had the same values. That gave me the sense of belonging, that gave me the sense of safety, that it was okay to, to not be in that rat race. And what I did is I stopped following the people who made me feel really bad. However, and this is kind of the nuance part of it, those people are amazing at marketing. I have an educational approach to marketing. I'm not interested in like scarcity marketing and, and you know, signaling wealth, right? Which is what I realized a lot of these marketing people do. And I'm not interested in like, sim- like dumbing down, dumbing down what's required. However, what I will do now is if I am at a marketing standpoint, I will look at those feeds and see what they're doing and see what I can extract and learn from, but not replicate. Does that, is that clear? 
Yeah, I think I'm in the same place. And I was going to say competitive analysis is, it's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. You definitely, you know, it's what, it helps business grow. One of the issues is though, you have to be mindful of your resources. And sometimes you might have very, very different resources than a business that is a multi-million dollar business, you know? if their ability, their ability to have, a mil, you know, all these online advertisements or reach all these people, like that might not be where you are. And it's, and then to compare yourself and just and be distressed over that, you just have to take a step back sometimes and realize that, that you have two different business models or two, you're in two different situations. You know, maybe that business is, you know, twice as old as you or they had three times as much money as you. Well, and you were talking about we create these stories is exactly, I had no idea because I grew up so like middle class and I just didn't grow up around people who had trust funds or had partners who supported them. And there's nothing wrong with those things. I would use them if I had them, but I didn't know that people had either outside support or they were spending so much money and going in debt or like all of these things were happening that instead I just made it that I was wrong and that I like sucked at marketing. That was the story that I made up, right? Which increased my doubt, increased my isolation, and it was just so triggering. So I'm glad that you, yeah, no, a lot of people have different financial circumstances. And look, I probably have it better than many other people, you know, coming from a middle-class family. So it's like, at the end of the day, though, I do think that's an important part of sometimes we have to surrender to the race that we're, it's okay to be competitive, but I think part of being untriggered is really grounding into the race that we're running. And, and being okay with that race, you know, and I'm calling it a race. Maybe it's more a wandering path. I don't know the metaphor, mm -hmm. but that, that does take some surrendering too. I think to just be like, Carlos is always like, cause Carlos grew up like lower class and he's always been aware of class. And I really didn't become super aware of class until moving to Philadelphia because people in Pittsburgh, there's just a whole different level of wealth in Philly and New York, right? <laughs> than Pittsburgh. It's like, and he was like, oh, this is so cute, Allie. Like, you don't understand the limitations of class. But I grew up in a time when middle class was actually a thing. And it was, I don't know, the, the gap between me and the next level of my friends that I grew up with and, and who, who went to state college with me, you know, wasn't as great as it when I moved to Philly. I was like, wow, this is completely other level, especially at Penn. Yeah. So, you know, it's just accepting that. And, and, but once, but honestly, that was really relieving to me. I was like, oh, I'm not wrong. And I can handle that. I don't have all, like, I don't have anyone funding this other than myself. Like that, it was actually relieving. Cause I was like, then it's just a matter of skills. It's not that I, in, in, in approaching things differently, right. And being more resourceful, which ultimately has proved to be a huge benefit for me which is something that's really interesting. Um, Before I forget this, because it's on my mind, I was just thinking about something. I told, when I told somebody that I was going to Greece for our vacation, the first thing they said was, oh my God, that's going to be so good for your Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was in, like, in the moment, I'm like, I'm not even going to take a fucking picture there. How about that? Like, I got, like, it was like this rebellious, like, like I'm not even going to like document my trip, but, but I, I probably will. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like people think, Oh, those pictures are going to be so Instagrammable. Yeah. That's Everyone's so going to be watching and have so much FOMO while you're there. <laughs> like, yeah. I think what's interesting, you're in a, like, I mean, you're 10 years younger than me. So we're, I'm definitely in the generation that like grew up in an analog, like we grew up learning cursive and not with the internet. So I think I learned cursive. No, I know what you mean though, but I'm also in the fitness industry and it's like the Instagram world of fitness professionals is like, well, I know you have, I mean, there's business coaches too and, you know, and holistic professionals as well, but the fitness industry, you know, when you brought up, like when you look at my Instagram, it's pictures of my body and I mean, that it's like, I think the fitness industry on social media is the worst. It's the oh. most, well, and you guys are such a visual ind industry. Right? Yeah, it's all, yeah, exactly. It's, you know, well, and the thing is like, it's not, we are, but we're not, you know what I mean? Like really when it comes down to my beliefs is creating healthy, happy souls and bodies that can, you know, take you far in your life. It's not about just having a, you know, some abs. 
That's true. But that's what sells. But that's what sells. And that's what gets people interested in working with you is that they see because that you have that. And then they're like, oh, well, she must know what she's doing. Right. I feel like this is the chicken or the egg. Like people, consumers want less sugar in ketchup. But then I think it was Heinz. They like decreased the ketchup and no one would buy it. Right. It's like, (laughs) and I feel Mm -hmm. it's like we want people to show more natural, more holistic ways, but then are people bidding, you know, buying it? And I don't know because I, you're in the fitness industry. I mean, I've had clients tell me like, I didn't want to work with this trainer because they, I don't like their body. Like I would never want a body like that versus I want to work with that trainer because their, you know, their body is so great, which is, it's so fucked up. But I, people tell, I mean, I'm not saying everyone is like this, but I've heard that before from clients. Yeah. Well, that's, that's good to know. I mean, I, again, I, you're in a different, like, even though we're in the same wellness industry, I'm just not about, like, I don't even approach the aesthetic side, but I'm yeah. not training people. So yeah. Yep. Huh. Well, and then I'll just show you my recent social media edge as well. So I was, I actually have become I wouldn't say I'm addicted to social media. I definitely think I need help with it. <laughs> um, but I recently figured out why. So I was not on social media that much. And then after the election, I realized I, it took me a year. I was checking social media constantly, right? As, the, as a news source, not as a... Once I, once I got clear on like who I needed to follow on social media because they had, the, they had the, the same values as me, it didn't trigger me because I was like, oh, they're talking about things that I want people to be hearing about and I'm rooting for them and I'm learning. So that's kind of a tip. It's like curate based on what your intention is on social media. I've decided to make social media a learning platform for me in a way to collaborate with people who are like-minded. And I think this is a question that uh, a lot that my, and again, my client Christy wrote in, she gave me permission to use her name, but she was saying like after truce with food, she no longer eats. She used to like eat and while she was on social media, like numbing out with it. And now she just does the scroll. And so she, and what's interesting, and I love that she shared this and allowed me to share it is because once you stop eating, you're going to feel your emotions more intensely, right? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and so part of, of this is to not not care, but to find the people that actually, and this is where we can use it healthfully, like actually are like, hey, I want to be doing that kind of work in the world. Hey, I want to learn from that person and actually gives you fulfills the intention of why you're going on there. But so after the election, I just, what I can now put language to is I was so blindsided by the election. And yes, maybe it's because I'm a white privileged middle-class woman, whatever. The point is, is it really put me back in that place similar to when I had cancer. Like the world that I know is crumbling around me. And Elizabeth Cronies McLaughlin, who we've had on the podcast, and she's someone who runs this, it's called Resistance Live. She, as it's gotten worse and worse, it's worse than I even imagined. She's like, all of us who cried on the night of election, she's like, we knew what was coming. And I do think my intuition knew the same way that I cried when the doctor said, we're going to biopsy you, even though it's probably nothing. My Mm -hmm. intuition knew it was going to be a shit show and it has been a shit show. And I realized that it reactivated that wound of uncertainty. And it was like, my way of protecting against uncertainty is to learn as much as possible. That's my protective mechanism. Because if I know what's coming, I have a better shot. At least that's the logic. It's not really true. (laughs) And so I really become conscious that that's why I was kind of glued to social media. And now it's actually just been the last week or two, I've been able to titrate it better because I realized what uncertainty and anxiety it was triggering in me and really realizing that what I've come to realize is this election was just magnifying. It's a diagnosis. It's not, it's not like this stuff wasn't already happening and now we can't look away. And so it's like, okay, you, you have to get to the root of this and the media is not helping. Like in my co-working space, they have CNN on. I hate CNN. I'm like, yesterday in Florida, they declared a state of the emergency because of red tide there. It's killing tons, like literally ton, tons of fish, right? Like our food supply. What do you think CNN is talking about today? Amoroso's tapes. And I'm like, you guys are part of the problem. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I've just realized like, if you actually want to make a difference, Allie, you have to get to the root here. You have to dig your heels in and you can't get enraged on either like every day or you're not going to be able to sustain yourself. And so again, part of what's helped me 
get off of it is connecting with people, especially in real life or connecting with people who are working on the same issues that I am, because that is action is the anecdote to anxiety. And so that's how I've really worked with, because I know the news has been a big source for a lot of clients. I mean, therapists have reported that pe- therapy, people are up with therapy, constantly glued in. And I think it's because we're largely a society of unresolved trauma, both little T's and big T's. So I just wanted to bring that up because that's kind of what I'm dealing with, my, my challenge with social media these days. Yeah, I love that you realize I'm not being productive by, you know, in that I know that you want to make a difference in the world. And like you said, action trumps anxiety. And that's huge. Yeah. That's such a good insight. Yes, yes. And, 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 and this is where I will use my platform to remind people to call on su- certain issues or highlight certain issues, because that's why I think social media has been really amazing, right? It's like, I just posted, I went to this smudge class <laughs> on Sunday about plant medicine. And Allison from Native Apothecary, you can follow her online. She's based here in Pittsburgh. She's an herbalist. And she was talking about white sage is native to the Navajo and another First Nations tribe. And white sa- they use white sage in smudging and other ceremonial things. And it's now on the endangered species list because all the white people want to use it in their goddess circles or whatever, right? Mm. And she was saying, like, it's really not ours to use. And it actually, from a plant medicine standpoint, it makes more sense to use what's in your, your family lineage. And, she, and we were using mugwort, which is really in the lineage of all European people, including Eastern European, which is where I'm from. And I posted about that online and like so many people DM me and they were like, thank you for posting about this. I had no idea. No one else is talking about this. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I'm learning here. I'm like, I'm misappropriating all over the place. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, saying that, like not intentionally, but like we do need to learn and we can use it as a great platform. And so it is about taking action and, and educating people and stuff, not just reading and consuming, I guess, is my little plug for getting actively involved in whatever issue care, you care about. Yeah, I think that goes to say with all, the entire thing of social media is it is helpful. It is useful. It's a way of connecting with people, you know, in a way we've never been able to connect before. And so there are so many positives, but you have to decipher the feelings behind what you're doing. And if you're having negative sensations, anxiety, depression, just like lethargy, whatever comes with your, your scrolling on social, you have to get present with that. And okay, what are the actionable steps that I can take to making this more of a positive and beneficial experience for me if I'm going to partake in social media? Yes, yes. And we're going to be back in just a second with some more tips for that and some more diving into the inadequacy and lonely feelings. So we're going to take a break and we will be right back after we hear from our sponsor. This insatiable episode is sponsored by my client described life-changing program, Why Am I Eating This Now? If you are tired of the on-off cycle, want food to stop being worth it in the moment, but not afterwards, and you want to stop self-sabotaging with food, this live program is for you. Early bird registration begins on September 10th. So visit alishapiro.com forward slash food freedom 2018 to sign up to be notified when registration opens for this year's live session. Want to know a little bit more? Stay tuned to the end of this episode. All right, Juliet, we're back. So let's move on to inadequacy. This is a big one. This is the not enough feeling, right? Don't you, everyone's like, I guess I just feel not enough. I'm like, we all do. We got to get more specific. <laughs> yeah, every single person, including the people that you think, the, the ones that you think have it all when you're looking on social. Right? It's kind of, if we think back to the peop, people we post, either what we want people to think about us or what we're trying to tell ourselves, the people who are always telling you to think positive, I think they're the most depressed. Like, I'm convinced. Do you, do you walk around being like, I'm, I'm a pretty content person. I don't walk around feeling like I have to think positive. You don't walk around thinking like you have to think positive. No, I actually like being a jaded bitch. <laughs> 
I call that discernment, Julia. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually joking with, with my husband about this yesterday because I was like, oh, this person's so up and they're so positive. I'm like, I just like being negative, like just funny. You know what I mean? I'm not really negative. I'm actually quite positive as a person, but it's more of the attitude. I don't know. I guess I'm just I'm a little more of like a cynical New Yorker. <laughs> well, but I would also say your actions are very positive and optimistic, right? Like you've started your own company. Like yeah. you guys are taking chances. So it's, what do they say? Like, do as I say, do as I do, not as I say. <laughs> well, my husband and I have this joke though. Like we absolutely can't stand those life is good t-shirts and stickers and hats that you see like on vacation. They always have the life is good like stores if you're in like Martha's Vineyard or something. Yes. I always, well, of course you would see, I was just in Martha's Vineyard, which is beautiful, but okay. To have a house on Martha's Vineyard is like $2 billion. So of course life is good when you're welcome. So I was like, I want a fucking shirt and sticker that says life is hard. (laughs) And it's not to be like an ass. It's just like life is hard, but I embrace that about it. You know what I mean? Like we need, I think that that's something that we need to learn more when we're growing up. This is like trauma is going to happen. Shit's going to go down. You're going to have so many failures. It's like always going to happen. So you have to just build up that tough skin and resiliency, which is part of why I like working out so hard is that I get through these hard ass workouts and then I just feel like a badass. Like I feel like I have like a shell that like is impervious to like, you know, things can kind of like fly my way. Yes. Well, the shirt should say life is hard and then on the back, but I'm boss as fuck. Like that's what I should say on the back, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, now I lost my train of thought, what we were talking about. But. Oh yeah, so inadequacy. So I want to okay. give some ex- ways that this shows up because I think this is really, it's really sneaky. So one of my clients who, who said that I could identify her as Beth, so that she finds that when she gets interested in something, I quote, research it to death. She's like, then I start following Instagram accounts related to it. So for example, gluten-free, then I get overwhelmed. Then I shut down. She said, so I'm learning to try and be more selective and even resist this temptation to follow people related to something new. Uh, Choice. Yeah. She said, I can have the same issues with Pinterest. Can have the same interest with ice cream. There's too many fucking choices everywhere. I know. But I think this puts up a a, a really interesting nuanced example and talking about how we have to know how our patterns play out. So, so, oh my God, I have to be gluten-free, right? If you if you have to be gluten-free, you don't want to do it wrong, right? That's the inadequacy. How do I do this? Or we think, and, and then what happens is we, if we're someone who likes to research, because I like to research too, that can be a positive thing to your point about how your hard work has gotten you a lot of places. Researching is really effective, but there's a tipping point, right? And when does it turn into the avoider pattern? Now I'm doing this to just procrastinate from really having to go (laughs) gluten-free versus learning more about it, right? This is, guys, often learning more about nutrition and wellness is an avoiding technique. It really, really is because ultimately you just have to try it. You're going to get glutened. You're going to miss a workout. You're going to eat sugar again and you got to figure out how to learn from that. Or maybe you need to trust an expert. Maybe you're somebody who needs somebody to actually guide you along throughout the process. And I mean, that's for me. Typically, I can do so much research and then I get kind of paralyzed by all of the different information. And that's where I just enlist the help of someone and kind of take the choice out of my hands. I, I, or yes. And I think, but, but getting the right help is also important because on social media, people will, what I've learned people do from a marketing standpoint that I kind of don't like is like, they'll be kind of mysterious about this formula that they have or this like, you know, I just discovered and it's like, and then like, they want you to engage with them which is a marketing technique I never learned about until recently. (laughs) And so they'll kind of leave you hanging, but they kind of position themselves as like the Wizard of Oz. Have you seen that? Like, Oh, yeah. I mean, my favorite one is like, you know, it's like this little banana guy that pops up and, you know, when you're on a website, a pop-up ad, and it's like the... 10 foods you've been eating your whole life that have, that, you know, you think are healthy, but are, have been keeping you fat and you can't, you know, I, I, you can't help but click it. (laughs) And it's like for 1099, you can get this guide. I never bought it, but I, 
I heard that this person who had who has this is a millionaire. Well, and it's like a PDF alley. <laughs> You know, but so many people are like, okay, I'm willing to risk, you know, $11 or whatever to get this top 10, you know, it's like bananas, they're high in sugar. Like it's ridiculous. Well, and that's part of the inadequacy. When we're, when we feel inadequate, we think that there's like something we're missing out on. And so we think it's one thing, right? Like even gluten-free, if you're like, even if you have to go gluten-free, I promise you, you still have emotional work to do. You still have like <laughs> all this other stuff to do, right? Like you have to get enough sunlight, all that stuff. And so I think for people listening, a really important tip is like, it's never one thing. It's never the top 10 things. Like anybody who tells me that, like, I don't click on that stuff anymore. Seriously. Mm-hmm. It took me a while, but I was like, these people, this is a marketing cell, not a health like information. Like yeah. I now read the articles that are like, the answer depends. <laughs> well, it's, and it's a crazy world we live in with people, with, the, with this industry, health and wellness industry and entrepreneurs and the internet because anybody can start a business and anybody can, ha- can make money by putting, you know, having advertisements and creating a PDF and not necessarily being an expert in their field, but being really good at marketing themselves or being very charismatic on camera and basically, you know, convincing you that they have the answer. I think that's such a good point. If so, the more that some, the more someone's a better marketer, probably the less. No, I don't want. To, we don't know that for sure. I mean, there. No, I know. A, I know. That's you could be a triple threat, right? You could sing and dance and act and do it all. And I mean, there are people like that who have the knowledge behind what they're talking about, and then they also know that they need to market themselves, and so they, you know, they're really good at that. But yeah, you don't know what you're going to get, especially and um, especially on the internet. It's like or, you know, social media and, you know, going back to like Instagram or Facebook, just so many advertisements now. It's, I mean, that's what we use for advertising in my business. We don't do direct mailers anymore. We don't do even as much SEO. It's more pay, buying Facebook ads and Instagram ads. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I haven't- Everybody is on there. Instagram in particular is just like, because of how many hours a day someone's on there. You're, if you have an ad that pops up over and over again on Instagram, it's, that's how people are seeing you now. I do like Instagram and I've started doing stories just because they're fun. Mm-hmm. And like so many people DM me. I love it. I'm like, you think it's like your little journal. I was thinking about that. Like when I was a kid, I used to have a tape recorder and I would talk into it. Although nobody would listen to me. It was just me. <laughs> <laughs> now when I'm like on Instagram stories, I'm like, it's sort of like that when I was a kid, except I don't go as deep. I could, but would that be too much? You know? So... <laughs> Well, and I think this is this is getting to the L and tail is I think a lot of us are lonely. And I say that in the sense of like, yes, I have people around me. I have really strong relationships, but I don't work with the team at work. There's so many times that I'm like, I want someone to see my dog doing this hilarious thing or like, hey, I had this thought and I, and I am such a teacher at heart. I'm like, hey, I think this would really help people, you know, and like, I want to hear what people say about it. And I think that's another thing I wanted to mention is I'm, you've got to understand also if you're an extrovert versus introvert, as an extrovert, part of what I've had to do to manage my energy around social media is be like, I get so much energy from interacting with people, but then there's a tipping point, right? Where it's like, oh my God. But being an extrovert, like I love using it because yeah, I can teach, I can like connect with people. And I think so many of us are lonely in the sense of, I'll give you an example of after the election and just half of my friends were really engaged and half weren't. And it made me feel really lonely when people, and, and again, just because they weren't sharing on social media does not mean that they, they didn't care. But I felt really alone with, it felt like I was carrying a disproportionate amount compared to everybody else. And that made me feel really alone. I'm like, am I psycho? Am I crazy? Am I overreacting? You know, and, and I just, I think a lot of us feel lonely. And then what we isolate ourselves even further, right? <laughs> yeah, I think that there's different sides to it. I think that, you know, for for someone like yourself, it's a great outlet and tool. I think that there is a negative side in that and this is a little, and I think that I'm struggling with this myself is, am I being attention seeking? Because that's something that I've always dealt with in my life is wanting the approval of others and wanting people to like me. And it's something I, you know, really 
work on. And so with social media, a little, I feel like that a little bit sometimes, like, am I just doing this because I want the reaction of others and I want the likes and I want somebody to comment and I want them to, you know, because that, I mean, the research shows you do get a dopamine hit when people like or comment. It's like, I, I almost think of it like getting a piece of mail, like, a, or getting, not, I mean, not a, any piece of mail. I mean, all my mails is like bills now or like um, Home Depot, a uh, uh, discounts, but <laughs> why am I getting like, ever, like a, it's always bed, bath and beyond 15% off. And then like a utility bill. It's very exciting. But, um, before, before like everything was email, we get more like a card from someone, a postcard, you know, it would give you that little, like, Oh my God, I got a piece of mail. And I think with comments and messages, direct messages, it's, you get that feeling. Well, and what I was saying about intermittent rewards, it's like gambling. You also know, you never know when you're going to get the comments. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, they, this is why people who have created these apps don't let their children use them, right? It's oh like, gosh. it's really, really bad. But I think, yeah, so we know all this stuff logically. But I think it can affect your identity a little bit because when we create this identity of what we think others like about us or what's affirming, sometimes we get very like stuck in that identity and then it can be hard to, to not live that identity or what if you want it, you, you know, I have a girlfriend who was talking to me about this, how she is like, I need to move. I'm like, why do you need to move? She's like, because my identity here is, you know, me as this person and I want to, I don't want that anymore. I want my life to change. I don't want to have that career path anymore. It's not, I'm, it's not making me happy. And so she wanted to run away because she's like, and my Instagram, all it is is this. And what would people think of me if I wasn't posting that anymore? I feel like it's almost like she has fans and they rely on her, you know? Yeah. Tell her she's in the avoider pattern. Running away is avoiding. <laughs> oh, hundred percent. But I'm just, you know, it just goes back to how deep this could be for people and how much meaning they've made out of, you know, their social platform. Yeah. No. And I commend you for asking that of yourself, especially at, at 30 years old. You guys are, I mean, not that all ages are the same, but like, I, I definitely can see that being as you're more figuring out who you are as you're younger. Like, and again, if you are, looking to the outside world, which I think, and I, and I, I kind of, wait, I just want to back up a second is I think ultimately why we still emotionally tune into this stuff, why we're triggered from it, even though we know all the logic. And one of my clients wrote in and I, at first I was like, how would you like to be identified? And she was like, goddess, which was hilarious because I <laughs> expected, but she's like, you can call me Lori. But she was talking about how she used to share like all the highlights of her children's lives. Right. And she knew that, but she stopped doing that. And so she knew that other people were doing that still, but she was still triggered by it, even though she knew it wasn't real. And she's like, why is that? Right? How do we separate ourselves? And I think at the deepest level, we are worried that we are wrong in some way. So then did she start showing the like just random moments in her children's life? No, she just, she just doesn't really post anymore. Oh, because I was going to say, you know, there's a lot of judgment from people when you post something that's not picturesque and, you know, I've posted, you know, what I call the, like an ugly selfie, which is like me making a dumb face and then there's no lighting. There's no nothing. It's just like, Oh, you know, silly face. And I've had people be like, why do you post that? Like nobody wants to see that. Hmm. And that's a problem. You know, this is, that's what I'm saying. These are curated pages. Most people's Instagrams, especially if you're using it for your business, which I'm using it for my business. I know you use it for your business. Most of it is just curated and it's thought out. And it's like, okay, I need to make sure that I post the thing that is going to let people know who I am and what I have to offer. So that as a marketing tool. Yeah. But because it's so tied into our emotional, I, I think on an emotional, okay, on a physical level, I think it's like we're all dopamine depleted mm -hmm. from the blue light itself. <laughs> and it's giving us intermittent rewards and we need more and more. But on an emotional level, it's like, am I right? Do I belong? Am I visible? Can, do people see me? Am I worthy? Yeah. Am I, yeah. And on a soul level, it's like, is my life meaningful? Will I be recognized? for the gifts and talents that I have. And that takes a lot of fucking work to figure out, right? That takes mm -hmm. a lot of work to figure out who am I really versus who I'm trying to, who, who I want people to think I am. And so I think that's why we get triggered so deeply is I think it really brings up these, 
these deep issues. Like again, when, when I think about how I unraveled from the new being addicted to the news, I was like, wow, I just want people to confirm my outrage. And like, that's, I can get that, right? I can curate my feed. So people are just as angry and outraged as me. And I was like, but that's, I, but I know, I, I know enough people care which has been really exciting to learn. And I'm going to follow the people who are just a little bit more even measured. They've been in this game longer because that's how I learn best, <laughs> right? And so I get, the, I get the, that I'm not alone in my activism and I'm learning from people who aren't going to, who are going to keep me calm and steady because that's how I work best. Other people are different, right? That's, that's my process. But I think when we can really honor that, you know, this is, and what I want, oh, what I wanted to say on the soul level is that often we think that we're jealous of other people. And yet I think what we can start to realize is in depth psychology, there's called the golden shadow and the dark shadow. So like, if you're really judging someone, like I used to judge those people who were like always traveling and I'm like, aren't they working? Cause I really value working hard. I knew I needed more rest in my life. Right. <laughs> so it's like my, my judgment was really a sign that I needed like homeopathic doses of rest. So when we're judging, it can be really big clues about what we need. And then when we're jealous of people, it can be hints of what we want for ourselves. Right. So when I was like, I don't know if I would say jealous because I thought I was doing something wrong. But what I realized in people who were getting especially book deals is like, I want a book deal. I didn't really care about how big the platform was. And I had connected that you need a big platform to get a book deal, which I've since learned is because I have a lot of friends and colleagues who have big platforms. I could still potentially get a book deal even without having these large social media numbers, which, but it was able for me to say like, wait, the only reason I'm triggered is I think there's a scarcity of book deals and I think someone else is ahead of me. When again, if we really look at, and we do this in Why Am I Eating This Now, getting to collaboration with my own path, it's like, I, my path is just taking longer. It is what it is. <laughs> but I can still write a book, right? It doesn't, there's no timeline on getting a book deal. And in fact, by comparing myself and just being jealous and not learning about it, I didn't learn the skill set that actually it takes to get a book deal because no one's chosen to get a book deal, even though social media will make it seem like it was so easy, right? And I wanted more ease in my life. Is that clear of how we can also get clues about what is important to us and what we really do want and what we need it, what we need from it? I love that. Yeah. I think that's so true because the jealousy or the judgment of others, I think it's so telling of what you're missing within yourself. And that person is just, just showing you, it's just shining a light on it. Yes. Yes. And I would also say just in general, taking less of a competitor, avoiding social media to numb out, like a combinator lens. And again, I'm looking at this through the, why am I eating this now? Truce with food framework is to think about how can you, how can social media work for you? How can you collaborate with it? And I'll give you an example of, you know, I posted that thing about using mugwort over white sage and Molly Morrissey, who we've had on the podcast, her episode is the astrology. She chimed in about this plant book that if I was really interested in other plants, it would tell you where they originated. And I was like, this is the best of social media. Like if you really get clear on what you value and you, then you will start to like collab, like it can be a collaborative tool to learn and have great discussion, which is the best way. I think the best outcome of social media, but you have to start getting clear on what's really important to you. And, and you can actually use your emotions to, to figure that out. <laughs> Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Have we exhausted the social media topic? Never. <laughs> we could do the endless scroll of yes. talking about social media. No, I really think that's it. I mean, I think that it's, it's not, this isn't a conversation about cleansing yourself from social media or going on a, you know, a one week hiatus or, a, you know, recently somebody I know did a 30 day hiatus, you know, I don't think that, I mean, if you want to do that, great. And just experiment with that. I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Yeah. But I do think for, for most of us, in keeping with the times where you, you know, it's a useful tool and you just have to respect it and be mindful of how much you're using it in the same way that it was when television first came out. It was probably similar in that it's rotting your brain, remember? Oh yeah, but it did rot our brands. No. I've seen what's on TV. No. <laughs> <laughs> but I know, but people have, but there's habits that like there's like television hygiene. 
right? We can all, we can all practice a little social media hygiene. Yes. And actually some of my clients who have, have really great habits with it gave me a couple of recommendations. One of my clients, I love what she does is, and again, cause it's not triggering any, she's been able to tactically manage these triggers. Jess Ivan said I could use her name. And she said that she checks Facebook feed about once a week. And what she was talking about, and I've used this too, there's a Chrome extension app that you can block the news feed. So mm. if you're in any Facebook groups or you want to get notifications for her, it was really important to see people's birthdays and their baby pictures. She sets a timer for 10 to 15 minutes. She browses the feed, reacts to posts, and then she comments on posts. And when the timer goes off, she closes the feed. And she says she does it once a week so she doesn't miss major announcements like engagements, uh, having babies. And she said even deaths. Yes, sadly, I found out about some deaths through Facebook. And again, she uses a shortcut so that she can, you know, log in every, she said she logs in almost every day. I'm sorry. She only uses the feed. She only looks at her feed once a week, but then logs into Facebook every day. She uses a shortcut that just goes directly to her profile page. I, there, I use the Chrome extension to just block the feed and then she can cho- check in with notifications. Another client said that she uses app detox, uh, app D-E-T-O-X, which allows you to create rules for how many times you can open an app in a day and how many minutes. So actually, I know. I like that concept because- um, You are cut off, lady. Yeah. <laughs> said another one is called Space, she said, which is eye-opening. It tells you how many hours you've been on your phone. How- oh, that I don't want. Yeah. <laughs> just I feel like it would just make me so- sad inside. I mean, so feel very sad about myself. <laughs> but I think I was like, that might be really sh- like, I wouldn't want to see it, but I think that would, that would really work for me because I'd be like, oh my God, on my deathbed, do I wish that I spent like a total of a year on Facebook? Oh God. <laughs> <laughs> and then my client Eva said that she turns off all her notifications because she said she had like a compulsion to clear the red dots, which mm-hmm. I can totally see that, right? Like, oh, I've done something productive, checked it off. She puts it on airplane mode at night um, and when she's at work. And then she said she's unfollowed certain people who made me feel bad because I compared myself to them or wished I was better friends with them. And she wrote the cool kids. And that was a big way. Like I felt like I was so uncool when I was competing in my business. But let me tell you, the cool kids have issues too, right? (laughs) Yeah. And you don't really know each other. That's the thing that's so bizarre. Again, you don't really know these people. They don't know you, you know, for the people that we're like kind of idolizing as having better lives than us. Well, and we also make it one dimensional, right? So it's like, oh, they must be cool because they do X, Y, and Z versus have you ever like met someone in real life and you're like, we have nothing in common. Oh, I've met so many really like douchey people that like online, I envy their life, their vacations, their business, whatever. And then I meet them and they're like, oh my God, they're so mean or they're just like not a nice person, you know? Or not interesting. Or not. Yeah. I mean, oh, I've, I've also seen that a lot where you, you think someone is extremely charismatic and extroverted and then you meet them in real life and they're like a wet noodle. Yeah. And, and you you realize that you can create a whole story through, you know, captions and pictures and people can think that you know, that's their outlet maybe to show, to, to make themselves to be extroverted because they're not. Yeah. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. I love that. And then I'm just, because you're right, we're kind of doing the endless scroll with this episode. (laughs) So I just want to do one, just a couple more questions to leave people with. Again, use the tail tool. Start to check in. You will be surprised at how often you can't even locate your feelings because you're so worried about managing your, what what it looks like to other people. But start to say, where, what is at the tail end of why I'm scrolling through social media and eating (laughs) while on social media? And then when you're triggered, what you want to ask yourself is, what does it mean if so-and-so has this? And often it's that we inherently feel wrong some way or we doubt in some way. And you can ask yourself, what feels unsettling about this? And again, I would put an asterisk, a scarcity mentality comes in here big, like, oh, I can't have that or I, you know, I'm missing out, not that you can't do it again, et cetera. That's my own kind of pro tip. And then what are clues of what I need, what I want? And what's important to me here, which is basically your values. So just wanted to give people those questions to start to get even more clarity and start to, you know, better manage social media so you can really make great connections. Because that's one thing Eva said, who turns off her notifications. She's like, 
I can't stop social media. She's gotten job offers and she's becoming a health coach and needs to be more visible. But I think if we can start to create discernment based on what's important to us and why we're using it, it can really be a great tool and we can root into who we are. And when we're rooted into who we are, we're less likely to be triggered. And I know that was the case for me as I started to really develop a network of people that I felt, you know, I could relate to and really connect with on a level deeper than deeper than just them being quote unquote cool or whatnot. So anything else before we wrap up, Juliet? No, I think you've said it perfectly. Okay. This insatiable episode is sponsored by my client described life-changing program, Why Am I Eating This Now? And that's not an exaggeration. Session after session, clients tell me this program changed their life. Or in the case of Shelly, who said, I wish I could bottle this feeling up and give it to everyone. If you're tired of the on-off cycle, want food to stop being worth it in the moment, but not afterwards, and you want to stop self-sabotaging with food or social media, (laughs) this program is for you. You will learn a clear and exact process with tools for getting to the root cause of why your emotions overpower you and you eat. You also learn with and from a dynamic community that likes to connect over the type of conversations we have on Insatiable. We simplify food, not give you more rules to rebel against. As one why am I eating this now client says, this is no, there is no white knuckling with this process. Early bird registration begins on September 10th. Early birds will receive a discount, early access to the classroom, and a freebie you won't want to miss. Be sure to visit Ali Shapiro. A-L-I-S-H-A-P-I-R-O dot com forward slash food freedom 2018 to be notified when registration opens for this year's live session. We'd love to have as many insatiable community members as we can. Thank you, Health Rebels, for tuning in today. Have a reaction, question, or want the transcript from today's episode? find me at alishapiro.com. I'd love if you leave a review on Apple Podcast and tell your friends and family about Insatiable. It helps us grow our community and share a new way of approaching health in our bodies. Thanks for engaging in a different kind of conversation. And remember, always, your body truths are unique, profound, real, and liberating. 